Ukraine has crossed the Dnipro in a major assault to the left bank of the river in southern Kherson, and it comes as their drones continue to hit the Russian capital, Moscow. My name is Jerome Starkey. I'm the defense editor for The Sun newspaper, and this is your weekly roundup of the most important news from across Ukraine. I'll start with southern Kherson, where Ukrainian forces have launched a significant assault onto the left bank of the Dnipro River. Kherson city became a frontline regional capital when Russian forces withdrew at the end of last year. And since then, the city has been getting shelled. It's faced a daily bombardment from mortars, artillery, rockets and missiles. The Delta is a web of islands between the Ukrainian held right bank and the Russian held left bank. And Ukrainian and Russian forces have both been contesting these marshy, swampy, mosquito ridden islands for many, many months. But in the last few days, details have emerged of a Ukrainian assault where they've made significant gains upstream of the city and threatened a town called Aleshki, which is the closest town on the other side of the bank from Kherson city. Now, this is significant because in the words of British military intelligence, it will present Vladimir Putin and his generals with a dilemma, which is whether or not to reinforce their positions in Kherson against a possible offensive at the expense of weakening front lines elsewhere. Now, we had a chance to see this, some of this fighting up close and personal because we joined a Ukrainian team on a speedboat as they launched a lightning raid against a suspected Russian position on one of these islands in the Delta. They launched from a slipway in the city, sped out through a network of channels and pools until they broke onto the main river, zoomed as fast as they could up to the Russian position, opened fire with a 50 caliber machine gun. That's a heavy machine gun that was bolted onto the front of the boat on a tripod. Now, as soon as they blasted their way through all of the ammunition, they spun around and zoomed back. There, there's, there's the other soldiers on board putting down covering fire because they were concerned the minute they stopped firing with the main gun that they could face retaliatory fire from the Russians. Now, they had warned us there was, was always a risk. Uh, the greatest risk to them was from artillery and Russian drones. The Russians have a lot of drones in southern Kherson, and once we were on the water, they said it was quite easy for us to be spotted. The only antidote to that, they said, was to keep moving, because it's very hard for the artillery to hit a moving target. And so as soon as their mission was over, I mean, even within the space, I think the whole thing was probably over in less than half an hour, and we were back on land, the boat was out and had been hidden away. More broadly, the counteroffensive continues. The focus of Ukraine's efforts is in the south central Zaporizhia region, where they are trying to break through Russian lines. But progress has not been as fast as Ukraine would have wished. And that's because the front lines in Zaporizhia haven't really moved very much since the first weeks of the war. And since then, Russian forces have had months and months and months to prepare thorough defenses. They've dug trenches, they've built tank traps, they've laid tens of thousands, if not millions, of landmines. And Ukraine's forces, even with US-made Bradley armored fighting vehicles and German-made Leopard 2 tanks, are struggling to break through. But nonetheless, those efforts do continue. Russia, meanwhile, so the, and the main Russian effort appears to be in the northeastern Kupiansk region, where they have been counterattacking very, very hard against Ukrainian forces. We continue to get reports of fierce, fierce fighting there. We've just spent a day with an ambulance crew in the eastern Donbass region, and just in 24 hours, we witnessed them picking up five critically injured patients. Now, Ukraine keeps details of its dead and injured, a closely guarded secret. But just from one day with one ambulance crew, we got a really sobering picture of the toll that this war is taking, the price that Ukraine is paying in terms of limbs and lives. We saw crews move five patients. Two of the soldiers had lost their legs. One of the soldiers had a severe head trauma from a piece of shrapnel that had punctured his skull in his forehead. The other two had severe abdominal wounds. One had shrapnel around his heart. The other had already had his spleen removed and he had serious injuries from shrapnel in his liver and his intestines. So it's just a reminder that even though some of these daily bombardments might not make the news, it is exacting a heavy toll, both sides paying a very heavy toll in terms of lives irrevocably altered. The final part of the offensive I think I should mention is, is, the, more, is the broader picture. And we've seen 
a series of successful drone attacks. Now, firstly, there have been the maritime drone attacks against Russian shipping in the Black Sea. The first was an attack against a Russian amphibious assault ship. This is a, a ship designed to, its bow opens, it's designed to disgorge tanks and armoured vehicles onto a beach. It was blown up in the, in the far reaches, the eastern end of the Black Sea. Then not at the end of last week, we saw an attack against a Russian oil tanker that was fueling, that was rather was sending fuel, delivering fuel to Russian forces in occupied Crimea. These are significant for two reasons. One is it shows the reach and ability of Ukraine's naval drones. And more broadly, it shows the effort that is going into crippling Russia's supply lines. That is part of the shaping, what, what military strategists call a shaping operation designed to degrade Russia's ability to fight on the battlefield by robbing its frontline forces of the supplies, the food, the fuel and the ammunition that they need to fight. Now, in parallel to that, we've also seen a number of strikes by Storm Shadow or Scalp cruise missiles. These are they're the same missiles. Storm Shadow is the British one. Scalp is the French one. Both have been donated to Ukraine. And these are bunker busting missiles designed, designed to go through significant hardened concrete targets. And we've seen strikes on the road bridges that link the top of occupied Crimea to mainland Ukraine, which is currently under Russian occupation. Now, taken together with the strikes on the shipping, taken together with the earlier strikes on the Kerch Bridge, that symbolic and strategic land bridge that links the eastern end of Crimea to Russia, all these things taken together show us that Ukraine is making a concerted effort to choke Crimea. At the same time, and this brings us me perhaps to uh, the most, one of the most dramatic developments in the last week is the success of Ukraine's aerial drones. Only yesterday we woke up to news that two Ukrainian drones had been shot down, according to Russian officials, near one of Moscow's airports. That came 24 hours after an enormous explosion at the Zagorsk optics factory in Moscow Oblast, in Moscow region, about 30 miles outside the edge of the capital, a huge explosion sent a plume, a, a, a mushroom cloud billowing into the sky. Now, Russian officials say that was caused because of a uh, the, the incorrect storage of pyrotechnics on a warehouse on the plant, and they deny that the factory was being used to make military parts. But those claims would appear to ring untrue. And then whatever the cause of the blast, the fact that suspicion immediately fell on the possibility that this could have been a Ukrainian drone strike is in itself a success for Ukraine because it shows that Ukraine has developed the capability to hit Moscow. It shows that he's planted in the minds of Russians and indeed in the minds of Ukraine supporters in the West that it's developed the ability to hit these targets. And it, you know, it's certainly an attack on a factory making parts for missiles when missiles are raining down on a Ukraine on a daily basis would certainly seem like a sensible, strategic and legitimate military target and important boost for Ukraine's war effort. With that, I'll come to the questions. Thank you very much for your questions from last week. Douglas Gray asked, if the uh, Russians are just the other side of the Dnipro River in Kherson, why is Ukraine not taking out those positions with its own artillery or long range uh, high Mars rockets? It's, it's a really good question. Um, and there's a number of reasons. The first thing I'd point out is that actually uh, there was a significant concentration of Russian troops right on the very southern edge of occupied Kherson on a, on a peninsula where they appeared to be training. And, and more than 100 soldiers, we understand, possibly as high as 200 Russian soldiers were attacked with HIMARS missiles and a number of Russian vehicles were destroyed. So they are using HIMARS where there are concentrations of troops. But one of the problems that the troops in Kherson, that the Ukrainian troops in Kherson have, is they say they don't have enough resources because the focus of the war is elsewhere, is in Zaporizhia, and it has been in eastern Bakhmut, that most of Ukraine's, uh, or at least a lot of Ukraine's resources are focused there. Having said that, we spent time with a Ukrainian drone team in Kherson who had discovered a fortified Russian position on the banks of the river. And this wasn't an artillery position, but it was a Russian base. Uh, they think that the Russians may have been using it to launch their own Folks. Now, these the drone team contacted the gun crew of a US-made M777, and together they launched a successful strike on that target. It was quite unnerving to watch in real time the drone feed showing Russian soldiers moving around position, knowing, as I did, that they were about to call in an artillery strike. Now, the Russians 
perhaps they heard the drone or perhaps they had some electronic warfare device that warned them there was a drone in the sky nearby and they had hidden uh, by the time uh, the artillery shots landed on target. So we can't be 100% sure what happened. We saw the first round land about 600 meters away and then the drone team we were with talked the gunners in until they hit their target. Of course, the other uh, factor in any artillery war is, is that there are, you know, both sides have guns. So it took them seven shots to hit the target. They fired two more on target. And then we got a message from the M777 gun crew to say that they were facing counter battery fire. The Russians had detected their location and were firing back. So they had to scramble. They had to, that was, that was the mission over. They had to take cover. Uh, and that, that was that mission done for the day. Question number two from Brian Beast is when are the F-16s arriving? The F-16 fighter jets, US made jets, which Ukraine has been asking for very vocally for many months. Uh, Zelensky repeating those requests in the last 24 hours. It's a really good question. The short answer is, I don't know. We do know that the UK and allies have already green-lighted plans to start training Ukrainian uh, pilots to fly the F-16s. And only today there was news from Washington that President Biden has also authorized an American training program to train Ukrainian pilots to fly these jets. So the wheels are moving. They are not moving nearly as quickly as Ukraine would like. President Zelensky and his military advisors, his generals, are fairly adamant that fighter jets could turn the tide in their favor significantly on the battlefield. And one of the things we've seen is that as Ukraine's forces have advanced in that south central Zaporizhia front, the focus of their counteroffensive, often they've had to move beyond the umbrella of their own anti aircraft protection. And in so doing, they've become vulnerable to Russian attack helicopters as their infantry and armor has moved forward. Russian attack helicopters behind the Russian lines have been able to pop up and launch missiles at the Ukrainian positions. And that has been a, a real challenge on the front line. The final question from the auto cool is, what is the aftermath of the flooding in Kherson? I spoke to a number of soldiers who'd been fighting on those islands in the estuary about exactly that. And interestingly, what they said is that when the Novohakovka Dam exploded, there was this sort of surge, this tidal wave, if you like, a surge of water that came downstream, uh, flooded a number of houses. Uh, the, the city of Kherson itself, closest to the river, was flooded in parts. Um, the, the water level rose taking out houses, taking out a number of Russian uh, defensive positions on the left bank. Um, and it has now largely subsided. Now, it's not clear exactly how many people were killed. There were outbreaks of disease. There was sort of, you know, real humanitarian crisis. Uh, but it was quite short lived because efforts were made where possible to uh, evacuate uh, civilians, certainly on the Ukrainian side. Indeed, uh, the Ukrainians crossed over in some points to try and evacuate civilians on the other side where they could, but they were doing it under artillery fire. Now, the water level has, has dropped. In some sense, has made it easier for Ukraine to cross. They still need boats. Uh, but since the flooding and since the water level subsided, what we've seen is Ukraine take a, get a foothold on the left bank. Now, they started that by getting uh, the left, on the left bank, they started taking a foothold at the end of the Antonovsky Bridge. They've now significantly expanded that. And that was the, uh, the sort of offensive that I started off this uh, update by talking about. And that is significant. So in summary, on, on Kherson, um, there, it made a huge difference at the time. A lot of houses were washed away, huge amount of uh, debris and disease flushed down the river and into the Black Sea. But in some sense, some normality has now returned, although all the way upstream, and we've just come from Zaporizhia, uh, the water levels are significantly lower. And you, know, you, you see that on the riverbanks, you see the tide marks, uh, the river it is significantly depleted. That's all for me from today. I'm coming speaking to you from Krivy Rig in uh, southeastern Ukraine, coming to you from Krivy Rig in southeastern Ukraine. I uh, hope to do this again next week when I'll be back in Sun headquarters uh, in London. Do tune in again.